Good morning, and uh, good morning, Dr. Moore. Good We're morning, Dr. Dugash. Happy to have with us Marilyn Moore, uh, the 2012 College of Education and Human Science Distinguished Alumni. And um, as in the past, we're going to ask you a series of questions about how you got where you are and some advice for the future. Um, you've been a very successful uh, educator in the K-12 schools. Your career was distinguished in Lincoln Public Schools and now you've gone on to other things. I'd like you to, if you would, uh, kind of tell us about your pathway. Uh, through your distinguished career, uh, focusing on where you were and bringing us up to date as to where you are now. I've had incredible opportunities. I, I've, I've had an absolutely wonderful career and can't imagine that it could be better. I started as a middle school teacher. I taught at Goodrich Junior High, that's what we called them then, um, when I was first out of college. And I taught sixth and seventh graders social studies and English. At that time, Goodrich was the most diverse middle school in Lincoln. So. Um, I had students from a variety of racial and cultural backgrounds. Um, there was great economic diversity in the school also, and I learned so much from that experience. I also had an absolutely wonderful principal, and I think everyone who ever worked at Goodrich would say that Lyle Bargman mm -hmm. was um, a leader that developed other leaders. In fact, when I look around Lincoln Public Schools for the last couple of decades, there have been so many principals and assistant principals who started their teaching careers at Goodrich, and you just know that um, Dr. Bargman was, um, he was a part of that. He chose people, he developed people, he gave people opportunities, and it was, it was a wonderful opportunity to, to work with him. And my colleagues, I learned there the value of being on a team. Um, it was very, very difficult. My teaching, my teaching assignment was a difficult assignment. Um, students were challenging at times, and, and whatever success I had, I know was because I worked with a group of powerful educators, and as a team, we accomplished far more than we could ever have accomplished individually. So I learned a lot about the value of team. From um, that teaching assignment, I worked for a federal program for a number of years. It was a program that was designed specifically to train teachers to work in low-income and diverse schools. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity for great um, travel, great conferences, great learning, professional development that exceeded what I probably would have had otherwise. And I was, again, I learned so much. Then that grant ended. And um, I thought I would be an eighth grade teacher and I was getting ready to teach American history at Goodrich. And I was thinking about how I was going to teach it through um, the stories of the lives of people and try to focus on, on history as, as it impacted you know, people like us in, um, in communities and neighborhoods and farms and cities across America. But life changes and um, I was offered the opportunity to be I'm an administrator in the Human Resources Department in Lincoln Public Schools, so I did that for five years. Um, great opportunity to learn the whole district. I hired not only teachers, but people from all the different support areas, food service workers, bus drivers, um, custodians, facilities people. I learned that a tinner is somebody who does um, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning work. I didn't even know what a tinner was till I interviewed eight of them one day. And you know, it was just it was a great opportunity to learn the district. And then I was asked to be the Associate Superintendent for Instruction for Lincoln Public Schools, and I held that job for 25 years, obviously longer than I held any other job. Um, but it wasn't the same job when I ended as it had been when I began. Much changed in education over 25 years, and so it was invigorating and challenging, and it never, it never felt like doing the same thing over and over again because it was always a different job. And during that time, the district grew by 10,000 plus students, 12,000 plus students. Um, we added, I don't know, 12 to 15 new buildings. So it was a time of great growth in so many ways. But the most substantial growth was growth in student learning, growth in our success with students, growth in what we knew about how, how to teach and how students learn. And that was um, by far the most exciting part of it, that you know, the, the numbers about growth of numbers of students and growth of buildings pales by comparison to the growth that happened in educational research in that time. So it was a... It was, it was a grand job. I loved the job. I loved the people. I loved the mission, all of it. And when I made the decision that it was time to retire, um, then I was offered the opportunity to um, take another, another leadership position. So now I'm the president of the Bryan College of Health Sciences. I'm learning higher education. I'm still trying to sort out what it means to be the president of, of, of a small college. And uh, so it's another time of great learning for me. And I feel privileged to have been in every opportunity I've had. I've had so many great opportunities and I've worked with such great people. 
Well, I think both organizations are very fortunate well, to have you. It's been, and, um, it's been my honor. I really like your focus on storytelling because you, you are a good storyteller mm -hmm. in the best sense of that term. <laughs> uh, and I think stories are very powerful. They and are. They kind of draw people in to the mission of the organization. That's really else. true. You had mentioned that uh, during the almost 40 mm -hmm. years that you were with Lincoln Public Schools, you had observed a lot of changes and participated in a lot of changes. Could you highlight for us some of those changes that you see as particularly promising or good for K-12 education and, and LPS, and some that perhaps were faddish or dropped off mm -hmm. the chart? Well, I think, um, I think the most significant change for, for all of us in education is the quality of research on teaching and learning that's happened over the last two to three decades. We know so much more today about how children learn to read, about how they um, become numerate, about how they develop critical thinking skills, about how their brain develops. We know more than we've ever known about how students learn. And then from that, we know more than we've ever known about successful teaching practices to help students learn. And since students and their learning is at the heart of everything we do, that is the mission of education, having that research makes, us, makes it possible for, to be, for us to be so much more successful. So I think that's the most significant change that's happened over that time frame. I think there is also um, evidence to support every educator's long-held belief that a student's experience in schools is also affected by a lot of factors outside of school. And there's an understanding that, that to the degree that we're able to deal with the whole child and not just the child's brain, we're likely to be more successful. So when we work with social service agencies that provide for needs that children have, whether it's um, a safe place to live or um, food for the weekend or access to mental health services or shelter in an abuse situation, all of those settings outside of school affect how successful a child can be in school because it clears a way for, for a child to focus on what they're learning. And I, I, I think we've always known that. I think we have evidence to support that. And the other thing that I've noticed over the last 25 to 30 years is I think we have far better bridges and much more collaboration mm -hmm. among agencies and I include schools in that, among agencies that serve children and their families. And the stronger we make those connections, the, the, the better outcome for every agency, no matter what you're measuring, the better the outcome if we strengthen those bridges and strengthen that collaboration. So I think that's been a, a really, really promising development. Things that have fallen by the wayside, um, I, I think that when I first started teaching, individual teachers did a lot of their own um, development of units and development, deciding about um, what will you know what will I teach this year, and that has fallen by the wayside as the as the desire for consistent standards um, mm -hmm. across the state <coughs> and um, really to a greater degree across the country has taken place, and I think that I think that's promising in many ways simply because what a student learns in algebra shouldn't be up to the whims of any individual algebra teacher, or what a student learns in American history shouldn't be uh, left to the interests of that American history teacher only. I think the downside of that is that um, to be at our best, teachers, we, we need ownership in what we're teaching. We need to believe that it's important. So I think the development of those standards um, is best done when there is um, an expectation that um, the professionals are involved in the establishment of those standards, that history teachers decide what, what American history looks like. It's not some outside political committee that's deciding that. So that's, um, that I think that's a, an issue yet to be resolved. You know, at this very time that we're talking, um, the state standards and social studies mm -hmm. are before the State Board of Education in Nebraska. And that's a balancing act because obviously the citizens of Nebraska have opinions about that and um, they are they're ultimately the owners of a public school system. So their voices are heard. The professional educators also have knowledge and expertise and their voices should be heard. So I think we still are in the middle of deciding what's gonna happen with, with how we decide what we teach. 
Yeah, it's interesting. The social study standards, the geography group yeah. feels very left out That's at this really point, true. and the history group feels like they're kind of at the helm. Yes. So it, it'll be interesting to see how that sorts out. Um, you mentioned um, teachers preparing a lot of their own ideas and putting them in, in force about the curriculum. Daniel Pink writes about um, purpose, mastery, and autonomy as the three things that really kind of drive us uh, toward our professionalism. Do teachers have more or less autonomy today, in your opinion? Well, I think teachers have less autonomy about what they teach. I think there is still great autonomy about um, selection of just the right strategy for just the right student, for just the right concept at just the right time. And our really skilled teachers have, um, they have a, a whole bank of strategies and they're the decision maker. And in that regard, I think the, the role of the teacher as a decision maker and the professional understanding of the teacher as a decision maker is stronger than it's ever been. Um, they're not deciding, do we teach, um, I know, do, do, we, do we teach two-digit addition in this grade or next grade? That's a decision that's pretty well been made. But selecting the strategy from all of the evidence-based strategies, that's the role of a professional educator, and I think that's stronger than it's ever been. I think there are also things like we, we know that teacher-student relationships are incredibly important. We have research now that supports, again, what we've probably intuitively known, and that is that students learn better if they like their teacher, and yes. students better learn better if they know their teacher likes them. Well, there are lots of ways that teachers can build relationships, and that's about as autonomous as it can be. There's no prescription for it. There's no script for it. There is simply the understanding that it is essential, and teachers figure out the best way. There's, it, doesn't, it even varies student by student. You build a relationship with Chuck in one way and you build a relationship with Sheila in another way and that is total teacher autonomy. It's just that you don't get to choose not to build the relationship. That's you right. have to do it. You have <laughs> to do it. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Let's say that a young person came to you, maybe a junior or senior in high school or somebody in their early college career and said, I really think I want to teach. Uh, and I just have that um, need to be there, but I don't know much about the profession of teaching. Mm -hmm. What kind of um, guidance would you give that person? I would want a little. I would want to know a little bit more about why that student knows they want to be a teacher, and I hope it wouldn't be because there's three months off in the summer. Yeah, because first of all, there's not three months <laughs> no. off in the summer, and it won't be the pay. <laughs> and it won't be the pay. <laughs> so I'm. Um, so what you hope is that there's a really strong mission there, um, a desire to make a difference in the world, desire to make a difference in the life of an individual student. Sometimes that comes out of their own experience and they know what a profound difference their high school English teacher had them and they want to they have that same experience. So I think it's important to have that conversation about mission because it drives so much of what we do as teachers. And then what I would say to them is that um, as a teacher you have you have many responsibilities, and I, I would put them in, in three really important areas. One is you really need to know your content. There's no such thing as content-free teaching. If you're going to be a math teacher, you need to know math really well. If you're going to be a chemistry teacher, you need to know chemistry really well. You can't be one chapter ahead of your students. You really have to know the content. And that's true for elementary teachers. If you're going to teach first grade math, you really have to know math because because you can't teach what you don't know. And then you really need to know how to teach. And that's where the wonderful part of the last couple of decades comes in is that we know more about how to teach than we knew 20 years ago. We know a lot more about how to teach students to be good writers. We know more about how to teach students to, to read. We know how more about how to teach students to read deeply and to read with comprehension. We have so much more research. So you need to learn that. Don't think that just because you know math, you know how to teach math. There's a big difference. And, um, and, so, and so you need to pay attention to that. And then you also need to know that um, this is a job that is absolutely an interactive job. And you're in control of yourself. You set the environment so that you can try to manage as many things as possible with all of the students you have with you. And then you're not doing that alone. You're part of a team. You're part of a department. You're part of a faculty. And it's not, an in, it's not an independent contractor job. It's not walk in, set my things down on the table, 
teach for 50 minutes and walk out the room. There, you, have, you have responsibilities as, as part of that learning community, which means you're also responsible for your own continuous learning. So you'll always be learning more of your content, you'll always be learning more about what it means to teach, and you'll always be learning more about how it is that you relate to your students. So those are some of the things that I would want someone entering the profession to know. I think we'll make this part available to every <laughs> new <laughs> teacher candidate. Um, You've, um, you've done an excellent job all throughout your career, and one of the things I've admired about you and still do is your focus on students. Mm -hmm. um, the student is the center of almost everything you've done or said. Uh, we hear often that students are different today than they were two or three decades ago. Do you think that's the case, or or is there such a huge difference in the student of 2012 compared to 1982? You know, when I'm in middle schools today and I look at the students, they don't look that much different to me from what students looked like when I started as a teacher. I think our society has changed and every person in our society has changed. So I suspect that 60-year-olds today are different from 60-year-olds 40 years ago. But that's just a function of who we are as, as, as a society and as a culture. I think at heart, students, students want to learn. Students want to be good at what they're doing. Students want affirmation. Students want positive relationships. They want to have friends. Um, they want to like where they are. We all want to like where we are. Um, they need parents. They need teachers. They do or do not know that at any given moment. None of that's changed over a 40-year time period. I think that um, our students are much more, well, we're all much more technologically savvy than we were 40 years ago. And in that regard, we learn differently just because we have more ways to learn. But it's still learning, and it's still a desire to learn, and it's still the question of sorting out of the information that you have in front of you, whether it came from 15 sources of journals that you pulled off the shelf in Love Library, or 150,000 sources that came up when you Googled something, how do you sort out what's important and how do you know what to believe and so forth? That's, those are still those essential learning questions. I think there is a bigger gap in students' um, access to resources today. There's a wider poverty gap in our city we have more low-income students. We have we ha we certainly have students from uh, we have more students of diversity, more students who are from refugee or immigrant families, more students of color than there were 40 years ago. Those are that's a difference in the student body as a whole, and that plays into sometimes the dynamics within schools. But at heart, I think students are their children, their early adolescents, their late adolescents. They're looking to a future, and that hasn't changed about our students. Good. I like that part, too. <laughs> You've been an advocate uh, for early childhood education. Mm -hmm. what, um, how do you see this unfolding, not only in the state of Nebraska, but nationally, and the role public schools will play in that early childhood education? I think it's one of the most important political questions of our time at this moment, is paying attention to our very youngest learners, because Children start to learn truly from the moment they're born. Their, their brain is responding to stimulation of all kinds. And um, it's, it, it, it's a hugely important developmental period in their lives. And I think um, from a policy point of view, I liken it much to when I started kindergarten, which was a long time ago. Kindergarten had just become a requirement of public schools in Nebraska. Before that, schools could have kindergarten or they didn't have to have kindergarten. But um, now we wouldn't dream of not having kindergarten. And in many states, um, all day kindergarten is a state mandate. It's not in Nebraska, but many, many districts have embraced all day kindergarten, saying our five year olds are ready to learn more, our five year olds are ready for more school time, and, uh, and that's a priority because it makes a difference in their learning. I think the next big step is saying, okay, if it's so important that children are in school when they're five, 
shouldn't it be important at least that we provide the access for children to be in school when they're four and access to all children to be in school when they're four, not just those whose parents can afford a preschool setting or those who fall in a category that's served by a, a special grant fund of, of some kind. I, again, within the 25 years that I, that I was in the associate superintendent position, our preschool program expanded from a few hundred students to about 1,300 students. So there are growing opportunities for children to be in a preschool program, and I think, that is, I think that's just essential because, um, because children, th they are learning. So, so let's be sure they have the opportunity to learn um, what is helpful to them, to learn in a way that promotes the development, their development, um, their cognitive development, but also their social development, their emotional development, their behavioral development. Um, families are, are different in that more, more parents work. There are, fewer, there are fewer households where one parent stays home um, all day with children than there were 40 years ago. So children are, children are going to be someplace. And I think that we should have the option for children to be in a really quality preschool setting um, from, the, from, from the earliest point in their lives that parents believe that, that that's a good setting for them. And I think we're probably not too far away from saying there should be uniform, you know, universal preschool for all four-year-olds. And I would like it for three-year-olds and two-year-olds. And it doesn't necessarily mean they have to come to school, but school, School provided services to families to help parents be the very best first teacher they can be because they are their child's first teacher. So just knowing the importance of language and knowing the importance of, of, of um, quality nutrition and regular sleep and all of those things that influence a child of two, um, it's gonna make a difference in how they are as a child of five. So I, I think it's absolutely critical. I hope we get there as a, as a nation. I certainly hope we get there as a state. Good. You've addressed a lot of groups <laughs> over your years in public education and will continue to address a lot of groups. Um, what is it you would say to a community um, about its public school system? I would say to a community that the work that's going on in a public school system is the most important work that's happening in that community every single day. Children and their learning is at the, at the heart of a community's future and it's worthy of their best investment. Their best investment in terms of opportunities for children, their best investment in terms of selection of teachers and support for teachers, their best investment in terms of stretching those opportunities as children need more opportunities. It is the, it is the community's most important work and every other part of the community's future depends on the quality of their public schools. Good. It's just true. Now, um, we, I'd like to, I'd like to elaborate on all of those <laughs> things that I have you elaborate on them, but what, um, we've covered a lot of topics, mm -hmm. but if there was one thing left uh, to be said that we didn't say, what would you like to talk to us about? Well, what I would say is that um, I, think it's, I think it's very typical and, and, and important as policymakers um, as citizens, as educators, that we look at large-scale information. We look at graduation rate. We look at success on reading tests. We look at, at number of children enrolled in kindergarten. And you have to look at that. That's that 30,000-foot view. But I think the most important thing to do, again, in all of those roles, is to, to, to keep an individual child in front of you as you're thinking about all of those things. So I had the incredibly wonderful opportunity to know hundreds of children in my work in Lincoln Public Schools, and now I'm getting to know individual students in my work at Bryan College mm -hmm. of Health Sciences. And I think we always make better decisions if we're thinking about what's this decision's impact on this particular child. And today I'm thinking about one particular student who graduated from LPS last spring, and he's now um, he's a freshman at UNK. And uh, he's a student who started in Lincoln Public Schools at about age 18 months when it became apparent that there was a language delay. And so he entered the early childhood special education program and had services at home. And then when he was three, he went to his neighborhood school and um, progressed through his neighborhood school for preschool and for elementary school and then to middle school and then to high school. And I, and I would just say that a language delay is no longer Eric's problem. He has way <laughs> surpassed language delay. 
But Eric, Eric was one of those kids. He's very, he's a very, um, he's a very unique person. Has a unique personality. Sometimes um, struggles to get along in social situations. And he he graduated last year as one of our super seniors. He took five years to complete high school requirements, not because um, he wasn't academically able. He graduated with a really good GPA, and he graduated having completed over 300 some graduate college or high school credits, and he only needed 240 to graduate. But Eric discovered early on he was a musician, and so he was one of those kids who took mm -hmm. as many music classes as he could in high school, which sometimes meant he was taking two or three a semester. And um, that meant he just didn't have time in that four-year plan to get all of his requireds in, so he took five years to graduate. And we are incredibly proud of Eric as a graduate, and Eric will be a, a really fine contributor, I hope, to the profession. He hopes to be a music teacher. I tell this story because in the eyes of accountability systems, Eric didn't graduate because he didn't graduate in four years. And no one who's in a policymaking position could look at Eric's career and say that he is any less successful because he took five years to graduate than, than if he had taken four. And I think of policymakers who look at individual students like Eric and say, let's rethink how we count this, how we measure this, because that's a counting system that discredits um, not only Eric's work, but the work of his teachers. And it discredits a system that says, if it takes five years for you to graduate, we're gonna work with you to graduate in five years. And there are situations like that over and over and over again, where um, a 30,000 foot view policy makes sense and then you look at an individual student and you say, and eh, that policy doesn't make so much sense. So I think as policymakers, um, at whatever level, there, 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 there always needs to be some room in a policy to say, in the best interests of some students, we need to be able to set this aside. We need to be able to look at it another way. So I keep Eric in mind when I think about, about the work that we do because he exemplifies just about every, every part of our system. And, um, and he's such a good example of a policy that, um, that didn't make sense when you look at Eric and his career. Well, that's a great note to yeah, end it on. It is a great <laughs> note to end on. It's a great note to end on. Dr. Moore, thank you very much. Thank and you. congratulations again for thank being you. our 212 Distinguished I'm, Alumni. I'm honored to join that list. It's Mighty Distinguished Educators. We're honored you came from here. Oh, thanks. <laughs>